Hi, my name is Jeff Sitch, and I'm the Clinical Director of the Alberta Peer Support Prevention Network. And what I want to talk to you about today is our resiliency training and information on what peer support and critical incident stress management is. What I want to walk you through is a slide presentation that we give to departments and to peers that is known to help build resiliency and aid in people being able to respond and limit the impact of psychological injury um, due to the nature of the work that those in the public service and public safety personnel do. So I'm going to cover a little bit of information on peer support and CISM, first talking a little bit about the impact of what public safety personnel encounter that is unique to them and the types of stresses. So we're going to talk about the types of stress, some of the signs and symptoms, the impact, as well as what is a peer, what can they offer, as well as having an evidence-based best practice critical incident stress management team. So let's get started. First of all, I want to talk about four primary types of stress. It's really a topic that individuals, we all experience it, but it's something that we don't understand. That we all have these signs and symptoms of stress, but it's something that we have a hard time identifying when we are stressed. So there are four primary types of stress. The first is general stress, then cumulative stress, critical incident stress, and post-traumatic stress, which is not the same as post-traumatic stress disorder. So let's get started. General stress is the stress that we feel every day. It's what gets us up on time, gets us to our job, maybe helps us through traffic. And when we get to work, our stress level resets, it goes back down. So it is a stress that allows us to perform and meet the demands of every day-to-day -day life. And when we meet those demands, the stress reduces. We then have cumulative stress, and cumulative stress is unresolved, piled up general stress. It's when stress day after day, month after month, even year after year starts to accumulate that we start to see the detrimental health effects. We start to see people that are described as being different, maybe more irritable, shorter fuse, it impacts relationships, performance and the person is just described as being unusual or, or not themselves. We start to see that there is a correlation between health effects and this cumulative stress, unresolved piled up stress that goes on. And we know that the research says that everything from chronic pain, fibromyalgia, diabetes, heart disease and stroke, and the list goes on and on, are direct results of this unresolved stress that just free floats through our body most implicated in this is a hormone called cortisol. And so when we have high cortisol levels for an extended period of time, it starts to have a negative effect on both our physical and mental health. Now let's move to critical incident stress. Critical incident stress is the type of stress that comes upon us when we are exposed to an incident that tests our limit of being able to cope. So it is usually something that is horrific, that is sudden, that is unexpected. And our body has what is a normal reaction. It prepares us to face that adversity. It's the same as actually the fight or flight reaction. And when the incident is over, for most people, over a short span of time, this stress reaction will also resolve. Some people take a little bit longer. But within a couple of hours, a couple of days, or a couple of weeks, we start to see people return back to normal. And the final topic in our stress review is post-traumatic stress. Again, not the same as post-traumatic stress disorder. So what I want to reiterate with this, what's really important, is that post-traumatic stress is a normal reaction to an abnormal event. It is when we get exposed to traumatic events our body is, is actually wired to respond in a very specific way. What our brain does is it focuses on the danger at hand. It eliminates distractions. It actually prepares our body to get away from the danger or to fight the danger. So everything from how our gut reacts to our muscles, to our eyesight, to our, our thinking, all adapts to overcome this traumatic event. And what we know, again, is that is a normal adaptive response to an abnormal traumatic situation. It can affect our sleep, our appetite, our 
interest in things, our ability to want to connect with people for a very short time until our body resets itself. And that's the important key. Our body, for the most part, resets itself within a couple of hours, a couple of days. Where we start to see difficulty is when our body doesn't start to recover within the one month period. So when we have a normal reaction to an abnormal event where something gets in the way of us being able to respond, that is when post-traumatic stress becomes post-traumatic stress disorder. But we'll do another video on that at a different time. The next slide I want to present is the general adaptation stress slide. And I want to describe to you what is unique about public safety personnel and the job and the level of stress. You'll notice that in the center of the slide is a blue line. And what that blue line represents is the amount of stress that the normal average person needs to have in order to accomplish either work goals, family goals, household goals. It's what sort of keeps us upright, keeps us awake, and keeps us functioning. But that's not where public safety personnel operate. What happens is, when a tour starts, or for those that are paid on call, when you're living with either your app, your page, or your cell phone that could possibly go off, your level of stress actually is more at the yellow line. It's at that escalated level that allows you that when the tones go off, when the pager goes off, when your responding app goes off, you're able to get up, get out of the house, get out of bed, change what you're doing to respond to that call, that incident. Now, what we know is that most people in public safety, they stay at this high level, the yellow level, through the whole time that they are on shift, on call, or prepared to respond. And only at the end of their tour, the shift, or should you turn off your page, your cell phone, or responding app, then we start to see your normal level of stress reduce down, down towards a normal level. But here's where the problem lies. When you go off shift, having sustained that level of stress to be active and activated, you go into a state of exhaustion. You go from a higher state of arousal to a state of exhaustion so that your body can rebuild. Unfortunately, this takes four days. Most people in public safety personnel either work four days on, four days off, or some variation where they don't have more than maybe that four days off. Or for those that are paid on call, you never turn off your app, your cell phone, your pager, so you live at that yellow line the entire time you are waiting or ready to respond. Well, this causes the same medical effects, psychological effects, as sort of that sustained high level of stress. Those cortisol hormones are running through your body. They're creating a lot of injury and illness. They have the potential for that. And unfortunately, the rest time between doesn't help individuals return to the blue line, the healthy line. So now that we understand this general adaptation stress response, what I want to move into is some of the effects of stress. So this slide here talks about the impact after a critical incident or a crisis. Before a crisis happens, we largely are driven by what we think and our emotions come out of that. But when we experience a critical incident or a crisis or post-traumatic stress, what happens is there's a disruption where we are largely emotion driven and it's hard to think. So once again, we go from being thought driven individuals to being, after a crisis, largely emotion driven. And it can be very, very difficult to think. This is where people, after a crisis, have a hard time being able to reconnect with their normal, healthy, adaptive coping strategies. They can't think their way into what to do even if they, prior to the crisis, had that or knew what to do for it. So we see this disruption occur, and it can happen to anybody. It doesn't, it's not a sign of weakness. It's actually just a sign of being human. It is inevitable, and it's actually something that is not controllable. So we have to prepare for what can we do when we see these disruptions. This is what we call resiliency training. The next slide is, I want to talk a little bit about the connection between exposure to a critical incident or a crisis, when the psychological impact
impact happens, meaning that our emotions go high and our thinking goes down, the next thing that we start to see is performance decline. So this slide represents the pre-crisis level, and if you follow over to the number one, you'll see that that's a functional level. Well, what happens is at that point of impact, see where that what red line is in that dot? What happens is when we are exposed to a crisis or a critical incident, because of the disruption in our thinking and our emotions, it's hard to know what to do to get through that difficult time, that crisis period that's shown on the graph. And what we see individuals do is we see them through trial and error trying to cope and get through the impact of this crisis some with more success, some with less success. And it can take anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours, maybe a few days. In some cases, it can take a few months and it can actually be career-ending. But the good news is we know how to intervene, either before a crisis to build that resistance and resiliency, and immediately afterwards to help individuals either return back up to that functioning level, meaning that they don't get stuck, or what we now know can occur is actually having something that is akin to an improved level of functioning that's now called post-traumatic growth. What that means is if we are functioning, that we are impacted by a critical incident or a crisis, and that we are helped either through ourselves or maybe by peer support to find actions and or behaviors that help us get through the crisis, it provides an inoculative effect in the future, meaning it protects us from future crisis and future critical incidents by having sort of this reserve of knowing what to do next time. So now that we've talked about performance, let's talk about what happens. And so on this slide, we talk about crisis reaction. And when people are exposed to critical incidents or traumatic stress, what we know is the majority of individuals will experience some level of stress. It may be uncomfortable, but it's not disabling. It doesn't impact their ability to cope or function. That's probably about 90% of individual. They feel the effects of stress, but the effects of stress does not impair them. Probably about eight to 9% of individuals who have been exposed to stress, critical incident, or traumatic event will feel the effects of distress. This is a heightened level of stress that starts to impact the person's ability to think and perform effectively. While they are not impaired and they may be able or seemingly appear to be able to function, these are the people that are, that are in that danger zone. They're in that danger zone that they may get stuck and or the symptoms may get worse. And this is the population that peers and a critical incident stress management team are trained to target and to help. So to be clear, for those in the green, those experiencing crisis, they get out of their way, they're doing well, they're coping effectively, they might be impacted, but they need very, very little other than maybe a check-in. The band in yellow, which are the people that are distressed, those are the people that we want to assess. We want to offer some sort of support and guidance to help them connect to their normal coping strategies. And then the final group in the red, this is probably 1% to 2% of those that have been exposed to a critical incident or a crisis. And these people are demonstrating a level of impairment or symptoms that are at a level that they require more formal mental health or medical support. The peer's role in this case, or anybody's role, is to link these individuals to those that are trained professionally to help address the symptoms that they're having. And these are usually pretty extreme symptoms. Can't really miss them. So let's move on now to the signs and symptoms of stress. There's five domains, as we call it, meaning that when humans are exposed, including public safety personnel, to stress, it emerges in five domains. So the first one is stress changes the way we think, so we call that the cognitive domain. So people become more confused. Maybe the ability to concentrate goes down. Our attention span is limited. We have a tough time problem solving. Some people might even have some nightmares, disruptions in memory, inability to calculate, and decision making. Maybe they're just more indecisive than they normally would. Time distortions, 
can also uh, be evident, meaning that people are unable to sort of assess sort of the time or length of time. And then also they can become a little bit more suspicious, maybe even paranoid. So those are the cognitive symptoms that we look for in people showing signs of distress. As I said to you before, our emotions get disrupted, meaning they become more heightened. And so we start to see some of the emotional signs and symptoms of stress as being emotional shock, sadness or grief, maybe a level of apprehension. Anger and variability are really common as well. And a sense of sort of being overwhelmed, unable to cope. Anxiety, fear, maybe even phobic reactions, avoiding certain things that might remind individuals of some of the triggers. And then maybe some guilt, remorse. So those are the emotional signs and symptoms. You can have one, you can have more than one, or you can have all of them. Now, where a lot of people misattribute some of these symptoms of stress is the physical aspect. More and more people will describe themselves if they're having a flu or cold or feeling unwell. They might seek medical attention for it, and after exhaustive uh, testing, they might be told there's nothing wrong with you. So what we know is many of these signs and symptoms that I'm about to go over can be misattributed to other things. So we see people really struggling sort of with thirst. They always feel dehydrated. Stress is dehydrating. Fatigue, never feeling that you sort of get a good night's rest or even during the day, just a level of fatigue that's unusual. Uh, sort of a sense of headache, sort of this pressure in your head. We see changes in heart rate, usually people's heart it's racing a little bit more and a feeling of sort of shock throughout the system. We see stomach upset, a lot of GI distress. And again, remember the fight or flight response. Our gut sort of empties and changes. And a lot of people can say, well, I feel like I've got a flu or maybe I've got a cold. We see this, this sweating that has nothing to do with the environment. So you're sweating not because it's a hot day, but you're sweating because your system is sort of activated. Maybe muscle tremors and chills. Sounds a lot like a flu or cold, and that's what often people will say they have. But really what they're having is a stress reaction. And there's some really good things that we can do to help reduce these. The next category is the behavioral signs and symptoms. Once we see the changes in how we think, how we feel, and the physical, then we start to see behaviors change. We see those that are stressed, finding it hard to be around people, so we, they withdraw. Maybe they normally come to the lunchroom, but you sort of see them hanging out by themselves, eating their lunch alone, or maybe being more isolated. Maybe there's a level of pacing, that sort of that sense of agitation where they're walking it off. They can't sort of slow down or rest, uh, that they struggle to communicate effectively, maybe it's struggling for words or, or even just contributing meaning, meaningfully to a conversation. It's a sense of sort of being hyper alert to the environment, always being on edge, some people describe it as. And maybe some more erratic movements or behaviors, less sort of coordination. Some people might also start numbing themselves using alcohol, drugs, internet, gambling. And for public safety personnel, one of the ways that they numb themselves is by overworking, taking extra shifts. They never rest because their mind takes over, so they keep their body in motion by working harder. Changes in appetite, changes in eating patterns. With stress, we see that people might crave carbs, they might crave salt, unhealthy things. We might see people that eat more, but we also see people starting to eat less. So any change in sort of eating habits, and then also changes in, act, in activity levels. People that are stressed feel more fatigued, less motivation, and so maybe they're not enjoying or, or engaging in those activities, those walks, those organized sports that they normally do or even playing with the kids. Now that we've covered this, the types of stress, how stress affects us, and the signs and symptoms of stress, in public safety personnel, we actually know that there's certain conditions that if they exist at an incident, they're more likely to cause a crisis reaction and what this allows us to do is be proactive. Not in that we automatically deploy and go and provide support, but that we prepare people in advance and then we check in with people afterwards to see if they've had an impact. It's an important aspect of resiliency, resistance, training, and system peer support. So let's talk about what these factors might be. I'm going to go 
through each one of them separately because it's really important. So the first one is suddenness. But when I talk to public safety personnel, this would say, well, tone goes off and everything is sudden. That's not the factor they're really talking about here. Maybe the, the word that's more appropriate is something unexpected. You go to a call or you deploy out, and maybe something unusual happens. Maybe something unexpected happens. That can increase the chances of that incident having a stress reaction or a crisis effect on personnel. The intensity. Maybe it's uh, a difference between a house fire and a block on fire. A house on fire versus apartment fire. Duration, the longer that a person is deployed working in public safety on scene, the level of stress is higher for longer, and it can be difficult to sort of reset that and bring it down, so duration of a call. The level of loss, I often say the difference between a motor vehicle accident with one fatality versus several fatalities, or the size and scope in a community. Age, we most commonly hear that really the impact on public safety personnel is responding to calls involving children. It's absolutely true. Over one, you think about it from a personal perspective. If you have a family member, maybe an elderly parent or a relative who's going through maybe a degenerative type of disease, maybe uh, dementia or, or a cancer, and you're called to the person who's the same gender, same age, with the same disease, the making that relationship with the age can also increase the vulnerability to this causing a crisis reaction in you. I think the next one with, goes without saying, in our communities within Alberta, it is not uncommon that our public safety personnel are responding to neighbors, friends, co-workers, family. Injury death to relatives, friends, co-workers, family increases the vulnerability of the crisis reaction. Availability of resources. There's really two aspects to this. One is, if that you are deployed to an incident and you don't have the resources, maybe it's equipment failure, maybe it's even a slight delay due to uh, navigation error or an address error, that can increase the vulnerability to a crisis reaction. But maybe it also has to do with you're going through a very difficult or stressful time in your life. Think about some of the what are the most stressful times getting married, purchasing a house, having kids, on and on and on, even retirement. And maybe your reserve level, maybe your personal resources to cope with stress is really low. And you deploy out to an incident, already having a lot of stress in your life, where that can increase your vulnerability to this call that normally would not affect you, having an impact on you. It's not a sign of weakness, it's just, again, a sign of being human. Level of loss and training. We know that new recruits, people that are maybe on their first call, their first tour, that maybe go to their first scene, maybe a fatality or something intense, there's an increased vulnerability of that incident causing a crisis reaction. So we have actually special training for new recruits in some departments, and we'd encourage you to consider that in your department if that's the case. Preparing them for what they see, but also having a routine check-in on new recruits, people first, um, first tour, the first couple of tours. I'm not going to say that this generalizes to students. Um, we're going to do another video on the special um, needs of students. Um, we're not going to cover that in this video, but we're talking about members of departments. And the final one is sort of a catch-all. Anytime that there's a personal meaning to an event, it can actually increase our vulnerability to a crisis reaction. Most commonly what I hear is pulled up to a scene and it's the same color, make, model, car is somebody that you know. Even though in your mind you know it's not that person, your brain makes a link that connects it to something personal. I often hear same car seats as my child, or maybe it's a, a roadway or, or a place where your family friends regularly travel. So anything, can't possibly cover all the personal meanings in this short video, but think about the personal meanings and if you start to notice that you go to a call and you're starting to make that association to something personal in your life, that could increase your vulnerability to that incident, this call, causing a crisis reaction. So now that we've reviewed the types of stress, the unique nature of the work of public safety personnel and how stress affects them, 
as well as some of the common factors that we have to look out for in incidents and the signs and symptoms. Now let's talk about coping with stress. Now you're going to look over at the slide and sort of say there's nothing new there. Well, it isn't rocket science and actually is quite simple, but remember that after exposure to stress or a critical incident, it's really hard to remember to do these really simple things. We need to be more emphatic and, and more purposeful in doing them. So let's go through the list. So the first one is keep busy, and that seems counterintuitive to what I said earlier, that one of the behavioral signs of stress is sort of numbing by overdoing things. Let's be realistic about what this is. This is getting enough body emotion, increasing your cardiovascular, to burn off that stress hormone called cortisol. It takes about 20 minutes of increased cardiovascular is enough to burn off enough of that cortisol that will help your body sort of restore and come back down to that baseline level. It really works. Now, getting busy, keeping active, what we're talking about is walking the dog, vacuuming, walking the stairs, playing with the kids, just your body in motion for 20 minutes. Strong body of research also says that if we are alone and isolated, that that actually can have a negative effect. So find your social supports, keep connected, talk to those people that you matter to and that, you, that, that matter to you. You don't necessarily have to tell them what caused the stress reaction, meaning the nature of the incident, but what about talking about how it's affecting you? We know that public safety personnel often don't want to share with their family, their loved ones, the nature of what they do in their work, but a lot of times helping them explain how it's impacting you can be helpful in finding the solution to cope. Do things that feel good. Sometimes after a call, when horrible things have happened, we often hear people feeling guilty about doing something that feels good. Well, that feeling good can actually help you reduce that crisis reaction. Can't tell you what it is, it's unique to you, but make a list in advance of what feels good. Next one on the list is rest. We actually know that if you alternate getting active with rest, your body will respond and recover quicker than if you just keep busy or just rest. In fact, there's a body of research that says that if you go out to a critical incident and you have a stress response and you just go to bed with those high levels of cortisol, we actually know that that crisis response almost locks in during the sleep and it can take a little bit longer to shake off. So this is why we want people to alternate between getting active, the 20 minutes of cardiovascular, and then resting. Manage your sleep. Most of us struggle to manage our sleep. It's being able to get consistent routine sleep so that your body can predict when it's going to be able to sort of recover, restore, rebuild from sort of the wear and tear psychologically or physically from the day. As I mentioned before, stress is dehydrating. That cortisol hormone really changes the way our kidneys work and it changes the way our body functions and it dehydrates us. So we encourage people to drink enough water to rehydrate and stay away from those foods and beverages that, that can perpetuate the dehydration. This is alcohol, caffeine, even high salts. Make sure that you're consuming those beverages sort of at the, the normal level that you would have before the stress. We're not telling you not to use them, we're just saying just monitor them so that you're making sure you're replacing the water with water and not something else. You know, our body likes predictability in stressful times. Unpredictability, breaking in routines can add to the stress. So it's one of the most important times to stick to a schedule, stick to a routine, keep to the routine until you start to notice those signs and symptoms reduce. So yeah, not rocket science. Every one of you can do these things, but it can be hard to remember when we're stressed. So here's your reminder. So I keep mentioning critical incident stress management and peer support. Well, this slide shows what peer support is and what it's not. It's not a replacement. It, it's not saying it's better than anything else. What it's simply saying is that peer support on the continuum of supports that we have falls at sort of the, the higher range of sort of training, not the highest, but at the higher range. But it's not saying that it's better than talking to your social circle or talking to your peers that maybe aren't on your peer team. What it's saying is if those people aren't available to you,
or you don't want to access them, or you don't think that they will understand, that there are trained peers within your department, within the province, in fact, that you could reach out to that do the same role that you do, that understand the unique nature of what you're exposed to as a public safety personnel, whether it be fire, EMS, enforcement, search and rescue. And you can talk to somebody that can help you reconnect with your supports and remind you how to get through the stressful time. They have unique training. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. So to be clear, a trained peer, a peer is somebody that does the same role, that has a unique set of skills that they use to help an individual return back to adaptive functioning. We'll get more into that in a moment. A lot of people confuse critical incident stress management and peer support. Critical incident stress management is a model of peer support that is shown to be best practice and has emerging evidence that says that it works with public safety personnel. It's not used with the public, it's not meant for the public. The public needs something different when they're exposed to critical incidents. But for those individuals in the public safety world, there's a unique program that we know has very good outcomes, and that is critical incident stress management. So this slide hopefully will help individuals understand what it is and what it isn't. So first of all, critical incident stress management is a form of crisis intervention. Stress, high levels of stress, is like being in a crisis. And what we want to do is, through the very beginning of this presentation, we want to help people understand the impact that it has on them, the stress of doing the job has, the signs and symptoms, so that they can stay healthy. But should there be an impact, should individuals that do this work be impacted by the call, something in their life, we have these peers that are trained to help stabilize those symptoms that we talked about earlier, help reduce them, and help return that individual back to adaptive, healthy functioning, back to the way they were. And if they need more, this is sort of a, a pivot point of being able to connect that individual to the best resource that understands the unique role and symptoms of the stress that public safety personnel are exposed to. So it's not to provide help, it's not to provide care, it's to provide some support and guidance. It's being able to relate to somebody that understands the nature of the work, the impact, and remind you what it is that you already do that's healthy. Because of that emotion and thought disruption, we're helping bring balance back. We're helping you think your way through the crisis to be able to identify those coping strategies that you know to do that are just sort of out of reach because of the stress. So our peers are trained in specific areas of competence. This is a really important under understanding that we don't just automatically jump in and provide peer support. We want to actually assess the impact. We want to be able to come up with a plan and we want to use the best intervention for the person or for the group at the best time. So what we want to do is be able to have our peers go in and assess the impact on individuals, on maybe a crew, maybe departments. We want them to develop a strategic plan based on these six core competencies or principles of peer support. These include providing individual support, group support, and we do that in two ways. We call them interactive groups or information groups. And then also being able to refer people to other supports. Maybe it's a chaplain. Maybe it's an employee assistance program. Maybe it's another person or resource. So the peers are trained in everything from assessment to referral, knowing what to do, with whom, when. I want to talk to you a little bit about what the CISM peer support team is. These are trained individuals, as I said, that do everything from doing an assessment to specific interventions. They're people that have been identified by departments as having a level of trust to be able to maintain confidence, to be able to actually help guide individuals through a crisis so that they can access their own support systems that are knowledgeable in the resources that go beyond peer support so that they can make a referral on if more is needed. They usually operate with the support of management, but they are 
reportable to management. And this is really important in maintaining confidentiality and building trust of the members of the department to access their peers. It's inherent that the peer's peer-to-peer -peer relationship should really be one that is focused on the needs of the individual who is exhibiting those signs of stress, rather than operational and performance issues that may occur in departments. There's other resources for that, but this isn't one. So, CISM, CISM, peer support, they're synonymous. I talked to you about it being best practice, evidence-based, but well, we have a model. There's 500,000 trained peers in this model throughout the globe. Almost 4,000 organizations, including the United Nations, have adopted the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation model of CISM, specific for public safety personnel. And what really we want to emphasize here is that it is not a reaction model, meaning that an incident happens and we respond. That there are six core components of the ICISF CISM model that must be delivered in order to have an effective programming team to be efficient. And one of the most important ones is recognizing that building resistance and resilience is inherent in this model. John Hopkins University developed one of the first psychological resistance or psychological body armor programs that a lot of the more modern mental health first aid programs and resiliency trainings are based on. And the author of the ICSF CISM model is the author of that John Hopkins Resistance and Resiliency model, and it is built into the training and the model. Unfortunately, it's the most often dropped by departments, but we're trying to encourage people and sort of say this is the start. We need to be able to help people understand the signs and symptoms. And here's a little secret. That's why you're watching this video. Much of what we've covered up until now has been the resistance and resiliency training, the mental health first aid, the psychological body armor. Now, what we also want to do is encourage that when a person is impacted, if they are already accessing their own resources, we just stand by and support, but we don't interfere. We don't want to disrupt people who are already engaging in their healthy coping strategies. We want to really be looking for those people, remember in that yellow zone of the triangle, that are showing signs of the distress, of distress, who maybe are struggling to access their own healthy coping strategies. We want to support them reconnecting to that. That is what the ICSF CISM model is. So it's a peer led program, it's a peer managed program. The model requires that the peers be trained and maintained. We sort of say if you come and train for the skills and don't use them, you lose them. And I think that really goes in anything in public service that there's a requirement for ongoing training, and this is really no different. Some of you might relate to this as being more of a technical team, if you relate to a sort of fire work, or having a unique set of skills that you use in your job, but this really is no different. It involves other support, meaning that the peer is not the only program that should be there. We have departments that include uh, mental health, uh, chaplaincy, and other informal supports. We encourage that to be part of the team. We stress confidentiality. The trust of a team is based on the ability of members of the team to maintain that, that confidentiality. What you say to the peer stays with the peer within those normal bounds of confidentiality that we all understand, risk to self, risk to others. We like to say the departments can really help this process by having standard operating procedures, making this something normal, talked about, even expected. So we encourage departments to have policies in place that don't automatically cause a type of intervention, but start the assessment phase. The system group must be able to do one-to-ones, as well as group information, and that all peers should have access to expert consultation, somebody who can help a peer through a very stressful time in understanding what might help them get through but also be more effective in assessing or assisting the individual who's seeking support. The next slide talks a little bit about key terms. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what a critical incident is. So let's just go through them really quickly. Critical incident stress management. Critical incident is a traumatic experience. 
that has the potential to overwhelm one's usual coping strategies or the coping strategies of a group of individuals. It's the beginning point for what we call that psychological crisis. Remember the slide where we say that we're thought-driven individuals who then our emotions follow. And after a crisis, psychological crisis is where there's a, that disruption, where our emotions take over and our ability to think goes down. That the critical incident stress is this system escalation, those five areas of symptoms. So our thinking changes, our body changes, our emotions, emotions change, and maybe even our relationship, how we see the world can change. And after a very short period of time, our body will reset and all of those symptoms will come down. But the really good news is this, that if we have an effective peer support program that builds resistance, that has a resiliency program, that isn't just a response program after a bad thing happens, it has that as well. You will have an effective strategy that reduces the risk of psychological injury in public safety personnel. So let's talk a little bit about when it's appropriate to use peers. Well, key is when the recipient group is specially trained or educated, that they there's a unique culture within the group, that there is a, they perceive themselves as unique or a little understood by other groups or civilians, maybe even a misunderstanding of, of what you do in your work. That there isn't a lot of trust outside the group, and, and it's not trust of harm, it's trust that we don't want to tell people what we do for fear of maybe traumatizing them. But what is key is that this program and when we use peers, it's not to provide support to civilians or have civilians provide support to public safety personnel. It is literally a peer-to-peer, -peer, the relationship pe between people that do the same thing. That's when we use peers. As I said to you, there are six core components and we have more than just one type of intervention. I hear over and over again that people use this word debriefing. That is not what CISM peer support is. It is only one aspect. It is the least often done aspect of peer support. Most commonly, what we do is we do an assessment. We come up with a strategic plan. And the most common intervention is a one-to-one -one support. It's about a 20-minute guided conversation that is focusing less on what occurred, mostly on what the impact was on the individual, and then helping guide that person back to their normal coping strategies. The second intervention we call is crisis management briefing, which is giving information to a group of people who are impacted, or maybe there's high media attention, speculation, rumors, they just a need to get information out to a large group in order to reduce the stress. Another one is called the diffusing, Diffusings are used very specifically and very rarely. There's specific criteria and they should not be automatic or forced or mandatory. They have to be part of a strategic plan. And what we have to see is that there's a disruption in a cohesive group's ability to perform together. Specific criteria as well for what we call CISD or debriefing, which is a structured group process that we do no sooner than 24 hours after an incident, and most often it's done three to five days later, where group cohesion and performance, a group that needs to perform and be cohesive in the nature of their work, is disrupted. And our, our goal is to sort of reconnect them to working back together. Again, debriefings seem to be misunderstood, autom automatic, and, and misused actually. And any criticism of a peer support program comes from only defaulting to a debriefing or diffusing and ignoring those other aspects of impact of individuals that may be other than cohesion and performance being affected. So be cautious and rely on your peer who's trained to do the assessment to be able to define what interventions are best with who and when timing. And as I said to you before, making referrals, people might need more. Well, the, the key is the peers would know what's available. So this last slide is talking about a unique program that we have in the province of Alberta called the Alberta Critical Incident Prevention Network. It actually is a network that covers the entire province where an individual, a crew, or a department can access support for their members. Member accessing support means having an assessment of impact, coming up with a strategic plan, 
and having peers then deliver that plan. We went to Will Free Number, that's up on above my right shoulder, that anybody can call 24-7 that is answered by a 911 dispatch center that is trained in CISM peer support. You're not going to get support when you phone that number, but what they're going to do is using a very common public safety personnel deployment app is in real time they're going to send a message out to the peers that are part of our network in order to respond either in person or over the telephone. Our average time of response is about 10 minutes to get a call back. Right now we have 300 trained peers in fire, wildland fire, and emergency services and our network will be expanding. And you'll see the website at the bottom of the slide that has more information on how this network works and who is able to access it. So please go and take a look at that as well as the additional resources. Now, you've made it through the resistance and resiliency training, the mental health first aid, the psychological body armor, whatever you want to call it. Usually this takes about 20 minutes. We train our peers to do this and we train them to redo it over and over again, probably about every three months. It takes that much to sort of build that resistance and resiliency to stress and remind people how to stay healthy. So if you have any comments or feedback on this video, um, please go to the contact link on our website and uh, send a message. If there's any topics that you want covered, please send a suggestion.